Yes, Your Honor. When I was six months old, him and my mom sold me to my grandmother for $100. So him saying that he didn't know about me gave me to my Your grandmother Honor. and took the $100 and went home to their happy little house. And when I entered the house, I turned the lights on, acknowledged my wife, and get in bed with two other guys. <laughs> On your wedding day, you came home to find your wife with two other men? I didn't have a father figure at the time either in my life, a feeling like she has a dad. Did you have doubts when you did that? Yes, but I felt kind of bad because I don't want a child to go through the same thing I went through. This segment kicks off the case of Taylor versus Taylor. Mr. Taylor steps up, hopeful that the DNA test results will clear the air and resolve Jasmine Taylor's uncertainties about her paternity, paving the way for them to mend their fractured relationship. Ms. Jasmine Taylor on the other hand, shares her deep-seated doubts about Mr. Taylor being her biological dad, doubts that were planted during her childhood by her mother's offhand remarks. Strap in because this emotional roller coaster is just taking off. Mr. Taylor, you claim that you always believe and never doubted that the defendant, Jasmine Taylor, is your biological dog. You hope today's results will put an end to Jasmine's doubts so the two of you can work on rebuilding your relationship. Did that just happen? Ms. Taylor spills the beans, admitting to some pretty major blunders, like tossing out hurtful comments out of spite, which her daughter unfortunately overheard and took to heart. These admissions lay the groundwork for a full-blown investigation into the real paternity story, revealing Jasmine's years of doubt about her biological father. And guess what? The plot is about to thicken even more. Her daughter heard those words and believed Mr. Taylor is not her father. You state since you were five years old, you have doubted that Mr. Taylor is your biological father. Believe another man is your dad. And so, Ms. Taylor, you say you let something slip. Now you haven't been able to live it down. I made a mistake. I said something to us Spike because he no longer wanted to be with me. So I was, and I did have a relationship with somebody else. I had sex with him one time. The courtroom tension just dialed up. Jasmine brings us into one of her earliest memories, overhearing a fiery argument where her mother blurted out that Mr. Taylor might not be her real father. This bombshell has haunted Jasmine, fueling her paternity doubts since she was five years old. Keep watching. The twists and turns are about to get wild. When I was younger, like around the age five parents they had got into an argument and I overheard it about her my mother saying that oh well that's not your daughter anyway so ever since then always wanted to know like who's my real father is this my father or not and you remember distinctly here yes definitely I mean I really wish I would have never said that things are heating up now Ms. Taylor dives into the murky details surrounding Jasmine's conception mentioning a brief fling with another man that casts a shadow of doubt over Mr. Taylor's paternity this juicy bit of gossip adds layers of complexity to the case highlighting the slim chance that someone else could be Jasmine's biological father. Hold tight, because the revelations are about to ramp up. I was like maybe four months when I realized I was pregnant, and my period has always been irregular. By the time that I realized that I was pregnant, I did sleep with the other guy, but I don't know. What times were you intimate with this other guy? Once, and then I moved to Merle. I was, next thing you know, he was taking me back to Merle. I always believed that he was the father. It's just that 5%. What 5%? I slept with the other guy. You won't see this coming. A look back reveals that during a particularly heated exchange, Ms. Taylor dropped a bombshell on Mr. Taylor, suggesting he might not be Jasmine's father, a comment brushed aside until financial issues like child support brought it back to the forefront. This throwback sheds light on the tangled web of emotions and the dynamics that have influenced Jasmine's doubts about her dad. Buckle up, the emotional climax is up next. When your wife said to you, you not the father, when you all get in that heated argument and she drops that bomb, what goes through your mind? When she told me that you know, that I may not be the father. It wasn't that big of a deal to me. The only thing that makes somebody care in that situation is money. When she, when we wasn't together, and that's when all the problems came, because when we wasn't together, child support net. I'm like, okay, then that's when the problem came about to me. This is the big one, folks. The climax hits as the DNA test results are revealed. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Taylor, you are not the father. Oh, God. I'm so sorry. Strap in for a wild ride. Right from the get-go, the court clerk rolls out the red carpet for the dramatic showdown in McKinney versus Davis. Ms. McKinney steps up, claiming Mr. Davis is her biological father, a fact he vehemently denies, asserting he was clueless about her existence until recently, and pins the biological father badge on another man. As they set the stage for an epic legal tangle, you can't help but grab your popcorn. And guess what? It's only the appetizer. The main course is just around the corner. Ms. McKinney, you are here to prove to the defendant, Mr. Davis, he is your 
your biological father. You say after your mother's tragic death, two recent medical scares of your own, today's results have become more important than ever. Mr. Davis, you say you are certain that you are not his biological father. You claim you didn't know that she even existed until a few years ago. You claim another man raised her. Cue the mystery music. Here's where the plot thickens with a twist. Mr. Davis's name is mysteriously on Ms. McKinney's birth certificate. He's baffled, claiming he wasn't even in the picture when she was born. This sparks a mini law lesson on paternity presumption in marriages, throwing everyone for a loop. Keep your eyes peeled, as the next revelation is just a hop, skip, and a jump away. So your name is on her birth certificate? Yes, Your Honor. So you did sign her birth certificate? No, Your Honor. She had to put it on. Her mom had to put it on there because I wasn't I wasn't even around or even with her. I didn't even, like I say, I didn't even know she, I even had a daughter. I she object. never even explained to me. I object. So by law, back then, if you were married, then that's your child. Then father. that is your, you are the legal father I, to a child born in the marriage. Pretty much, that's what I was told. You might want to sit down for this bombshell. Mr. Davis claims his marriage lasted about as long as a sneeze. He recounts a jaw-dropping tale of returning home on his wedding day, only to find his bride less than lonely. Yep, you heard that right. She was with two other guys. As the courtroom gasps echo off the walls, buckle up because the roller coaster is nowhere near the final stop. Well, I was with her for one day. What? Yes. Y'all yes. lived together. You were married for one day. But they lived we together. together. The day we got married, I took off. We got married and I had to go back to work. And so once I finished my shift off, my house was dark. And when I entered the house, I turned the lights on, acknowledged my wife and she in bed with two other guys. <laughs> On your wedding day, you came home to find your wife with two other men? Yes, Your Honor. Talk about a plot twist. Ms. McKinney reveals a chance encounter led her to Mr. Davis, thanks to her boyfriend's sharp eye on a birth certificate. Their initial meet-cute was like something out of a feel-good movie, full of hugs and familial warmth. But don't get too comfy in that warm, fuzzy feeling. It's about to get a chilly breeze of doubt and confusion. We were talking about family. He was like, let me see your birth certificate. I'll let him see mine. I know your mama and your dad. He was, I was like, oh, I don't know my father. I never met him. And I was like, yes. And they called Michael and told him they got a birth certificate here with your name on it. And he asked them, well, who's the mother? And they said Antigone. So the next day they came down, we met. Enter stage left. Mr. Williams, who might as well have dad, flashing above his head in neon lights. He's been in the picture since day one, even in the delivery room. But hold your horses. Despite his frontline fatherhood role, the biological ties are as clear as mud. Just when you think you've got it figured out, the story spins again. You raised her. She testified that you raised her. What was the nature of your relationship with her? Been there ever since she was born. I was there in the delivery room with, you know, with, with her mother. Did you believe you were her biological? What did her mom tell you about her pregnancy? After we'd been together, and then maybe about six months into the relationship, she told me she was pregnant. And now, the moment we've all been waiting for, drum roll please, but maybe keep it soft because this one's a heartbreaker. It has been determined by this court. Mr. David, you are not. <laughs> Can you believe we're starting off like this? Ms. Barrett brings a lawsuit against her father, Mr. Jones, claiming a whopping $5,000 for emotional distress due to a childhood she describes as neglected and significant absences during critical life moments, like her mother's funeral. And you thought your family reunions were drama-filled. Just wait until you see what's coming up next. Ms. Barrett, you are suing the defendant for $5,000 in debt for emotional distress. The defendant may be your biological father. You say he has never been there for you. In fact, you claim he wouldn't even show up for your mother's funeral when you were just 16 years old. The plot thickens immediately. Mr. Jones fires back, denying any financial responsibility and demands a paternity test, casting doubt over Ms. Barrett's claims due to some spicy revelations about her mother's past infidelities around the time of conception. The courtroom's about to turn into a pressure cooker. Keep your eyes peeled. You deny Ms. Ms. Barrett is owed financial damages due to emotional damage. Even though her mother admitted to you she slept with another man when Ms. Barrett, as well as an award of $500 for money the plaintiff stole from you. Here's where it gets juicy. Ms. Barrett dives deeper into her emotional turmoil, painting a picture of a father who was virtually absent from all the important snapshots of her life, including her birthdays and, most painfully, her mother's funeral. Strap in, because the emotional roller coaster is just picking up speed. Never wanted to go to any of my birthdays. He claims he did, but he didn't show up to any of my birth. He wasn't there at all for me when I was a kid. Just as 
because he's supposed to be my dad. All I got from him was that he couldn't go and to give my mom because he still loves my mom. This testimony hits hard. Mr. Jones defends his decision to skip the funeral, arguing it would be inappropriate given his current life situation, which stirs up a hornet's nest of bitter exchanges about missed funerals and lingering resentments. Buckle up because there's more turbulence ahead. Not right for me to be there. I was no longer with her mother. This is my future here, and it would be disrespect to my new fiance of going to her mother's funeral, which she didn't even show up for my parents that passed away before her, her mother did. Everyone in the courtroom needed a moment to process this one. Mr. Jones shockingly admits he had doubts about being the father right from the start, spurred by the bombshell that Ms. Barrett's mother dropped about her romantic escapades during her pregnancy. The next part is a real mic drop moment. Why are you not on the birth certificate, Mr. Jones? Did you have- Brought her into my life. Take me back. When Ms. Barrett was born- uh, No, I wasn't, Your Honor. I was with somebody else. She was not brought into my life. Until... Did you know her mother was pregnant? In front of a party store, hanging out with my friends, and told me that she had had to talk to me, which my daughter was in the back seat as a child. Talk about a plot twist. Ms. Barrett drops a bombshell claim that she was sold to her grandmother for a mere $100 when she was just six months old, thanks to her parents' desperate need for rent money. The audience gasped, and so will you when you hear what's coming up. When I was six months old, him and my mom sold me to my grandmother for $100. So him <laughs> saying that he didn't know about me and told her that they needed rent money, they were $100 short. My grandma said, the only way I'm giving you $100, give me that baby, because I was in rag, gave me to my Your grandmother Honor. and took the hundred dollars and went home to their happy little house. Things are heating up. The tension doesn't let up as Ms. Barrett accuses Mr. Jones of being overly controlling during the short time she lived with him, treating her more like a girlfriend than a daughter, which Mr. Jones vehemently denies, emphasizing his intent to be protective. Fasten your seatbelts. It's about to get even wilder. $300 he, purses. He doubted whether or not you were his He did That's say that, that he didn't think that I was his daughter. He also told my mom that. He told my mom that he did not believe that I was, he can say what he wants in front of his girlfriend, but he's told my mom. I ain't never stated that. If I loved her mom, I could I left her behind and moved on with my life. You'll be on the edge of your seat for this one. The conflict reaches a boiling point with allegations of theft flying back and forth. Mr. Jones accuses Ms. Barrett and her friend of pilfering $500 leading to police intervention. Claims that Ms. Barrett fiercely denies. The climax is just around the bend and it's a jaw dropper. Called the police and had her because she ripped me off $500. Her and her friend went out and bought new. I had to go do a couple of Aaron. So I left some, I left them money to get them something to eat. So I was gone longer than what I figured I was going to be gone. I unlocked the door, come inside. Well, her and her friend sitting in the lift. Here comes the grand finale in a dramatic revelation. It has been determined by this court that Mr. Jones, you are her father. Ms. Pringle accuses Mr. Brown of denying their 18-month-old daughter, Tatiana. She is upset because he has ignored Tatiana's existence since birth. She hopes the DNA test will make him acknowledge his paternity and responsibilities. Brace yourself, Mr. Brown's retort is up next, and it's a doozy. You open this case against Mr. Brown because you say he denies fathering your eight-year-old daughter, Tatiana. You state he has acted like she doesn't exist since the day she was born. You want Mr. Brown to step up after today's result? Prove he is the father. Ms. Pringle emotionally explains how her past mistake of infidelity is affecting her daughter's chance to have a father. She breaks down, expressing the pain of raising her daughter alone, highlighting the emotional stakes of the paternity test. Get ready, because the emotional roller coaster is just picking up speed. Can you tell the court what that feels like? I see the tears in your eyes. It hurts really bad because I have to raise her on my own and no child should go through that. Can you look at Mr. Brown and tell him how much this hurt? It hurts really bad that you're denying my daughter. A poignant moment unfolds as Ms. Pringle directly addresses Mr. Brown in court, conveying the deep emotional impact of his denial on both her and their daughter. She tearfully explains how their daughter looks for her father daily. Hang on, because what happens next will really pull at your heartstrings. She looks for you every day, and she she says, Daddy, every day, but you're nowhere around to help me raise her. She's probably like, where's my daddy? Nobody cares about me but my mother. The reason why I feel like that because time she was saying like this situation she cheated on me always a cheater will be a cheater. The narrative takes a turn as Ms. Pringle recounts the moment she discovered her pregnancy and informed Mr. Brown. His initial happiness turns to doubt following their breakup, complicating the story with their on and off relationship dynamics. Stick around, the judge's insights next are not to be missed. Went to a free clinic and I took the test and they said that it was four weeks and three days. Pregnant? Yes. And then you called Mr. Brown? Yes, and I told him I was pregnant. He 
he was happy. We were together for like two months and we broke up. And so he was happy, yeah. but for two months? Mr. Brown, you were only happy for two months? We didn't have sex at the time, like the casino time that she got pregnant. Judge Lake delves into the couple's troubled relationship post-infidelity, with Mr. Brown's trust issues being highlighted. This insight into their personal struggles adds depth to the paternity dispute. Just when you thought it couldn't get more intense, Mr. Brown drops a bombshell. All your red flags, all your senses up. Spidey sense is on overdrive. Every time you got a call and then you had to leave the room to talk, even if it was a family member and you had to, I'd have been like, oh, you can't talk to your family member in front of me? You hear that, Jerome? That's what that I would have said right? to you, okay? That is, something isn't imputing, especially after infidelity in a relationship. Yes. Mr. Brown admits to signing the birth certificate despite his doubts, driven by his desire to provide a father figure for Tatiana. This admission reveals his conflicting emotions and the complexity of his decisions. Up next, the evidence showdown is about to change everything. You didn't come to the birth? No. So I guess you didn't sign the birth certificate Either. I signed it because I felt like I didn't have a father figure at the time either in my life, so a feeling like she has a dad to depend on. Did you have doubts when you did that? Yes, but I felt kind of bad because I don't want a child to go through the same thing I went through. Both parties claim to have medical evidence proving their respective cases, setting the stage for a dramatic revelation. The anticipation builds as they prepare to present their evidence to the court. Don't go anywhere. The evidence reveal is a real jaw dropper. Well, this is a first in this courtroom. You say you both both have medical evidence that proves your case. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Pringle, you say you have medical evidence that proves Mr. Brown is Tatiana's biological father. Mr. Brown, you say you have medical evidence that proves there is no way you can be Tatiana's biological yes. father. Ms. Pringle presents her medical evidence that links physical traits and conditions between Mr. Brown and Tatiana, such as lactose intolerance and similar physical quirks, attempting to establish a biological connection. Next up, Jerome takes the stage and it's hilariously enlightening. She's lactose lactose intolerant, so is he, and other family members, and his lactose intolerant, I'm not. She has the same hairline as him, and she also does this squat that he- A like she, squat? Yes, yeah, she does it all the time. What is the squat? Like, when I'm fixing on something, I'll... Let me see. I could do that. <laughs> In a lighter moment, the court laughs as Jerome, the court officer, attempts a physical squat to demonstrate a trait Ms. Pringle associates with Mr. Brown, adding a humorous break in the tension. But don't relax just yet. The expert's testimony up next brings us back to the core of the case. Jerome, <laughs> now can you squat down there like that? Exactly how oh, shoot! <laughs> oh, and then... <laughs> I gotta laugh to keep from crying. It ain't... It's not the same, though. It's not the same squat. You gotta be even on both legs. Uh-oh, Jerome, uh-oh! <laughs> <laughs> I have a good gun belt on. Oh, okay, okay. Your gun belt is holding you back. Okay, okay. So, thank you, Jerome, for your... <laughs> Expert testimony from Dr. Gator discusses the heritability of lactose intolerance and asthma, crucial to the case's medical claims. This scientific perspective aims to clarify the genetic connections, or lack thereof, pertinent to the paternity dispute. The moment of truth is just around the corner, and it's a doozy. Mr. Brown is lactose intolerant, and her daughter is lactose intolerant, and there are people in his fam who are also lactose intolerant. Explain to the court whether this is something that is passed down, is hereditary. How do you become lack. That's a great question, actually. So your lactose intolerant body doesn't produce an enzyme called lac, and lactase is what breaks down the milk. As the DNA results are about to be revealed, Ms. Pringle makes a heartfelt plea to Mr. Brown about her needs and expectations for him as a father, emphasizing the real-life implications of the case beyond the courtroom drama. The DNA reveal is next, and it's a real game-changer. What you want and what you need. You've been with Tatiana by yourself for 18 months. I want you to help me financially, emotionally, and physically to be there for her and show her what a guy shouldn't do to her when she grows up. I have to be there and teach her all these things. The DNA results confirm. It has been determined by this court. Mr. Brown, you are the father. Woo!